So good evening, Dharani Bhaskar. Today we have Dharani Bhaskar, the famous authoress, I would say, of a book called "These Body, These Our Bodies Possessed by Light." And Dharani, if I may ask you, you know, the first basic question, which I think you must have been asked a few number of times, what is your interpretation of these our bodies possessed by light? If one can say, I mean, what do you mean when you say possessed by light? You know, because light if i look at light itself it's very i mean you have the speed of light and light itself means something which is not uh, is difficult to measure itself you know yeah. very intangible thing and yet all around us so what is it exactly you mean by that i love your question and i am very hesitant to answer it only because i want to leave the title as also the way the novel ends uh, to every reader's imagination. Um, if I tell you uh, what motivated the title, I can tell you, however, that the title is drawn from a poem and very much in love with a poem titled mm -hmm. Sherizad by Richard Saikin. It appears in his collection of poetry called Crush. Um, I chose the poem because Sherizad is, you know, a word that uh, does bind the novel together without, you know, being a reference I make continually, it is a word that binds the novel. It's the cement that holds it together. Uh, and uh, these are bodies possessed by light, a fragment that appears in the poem. Like you say, light is a very interesting word because uh, it's there, and yet it is also not quite there. You can't uh, you can't pin down light. Light escapes your fingers. Uh, light uh, warms your hands, but you can't quite you can't quite define it. And I feel that that is something that does play uh, upon uh, the way the novel is written, the fact that there are stories in the novel that we may not be able to pin down. I think that's the extent to which I'd like my interpretation to go because mm -hmm. I do want every reader to take away something from the title that is unique and that is drawn from their own lived experiences. Okay, thank you, Dani. I did, I did read the novel and uh... I'm aware of the link with Shehzade and that is why I said Richard may have a different meaning for it and your novel may have a different meaning for it and now one that you have narrated and I can understand. Now if we look at this novel is um, more about familial history, you know, history which runs in our families, you know, and if we um, look, at, look at it in contrast to history that we see as an academic discipline or history that is played out, I mean, on the much larger canvas of life, you know, see, uh, I feel that individual's uh, happiness and his own growth is determined more by his family history than by the broad sweep of history. You know, like my happiness is more on whom I marry, what my parents are, rather than, you know, uh, to some extent, yes, depending on who the rulers are, but but uh, largely is like about my own personal sphere, you know. So is your novel an attempt to say, okay, yes, you know, these histories and the families are also central, which have so far been taken as peripheral or not? worth discussing? I, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, one of the attempts that I have made through my novel is to reclaim the domestic. I think there is a tendency to view uh, women's stories, particularly those set in the domestic, as sentimental, as trivial, as unworthy of attention. We need to we, we tend to dismiss them. We uh, push them to the margins. And uh, that's an absolute pity, because if you ask me, uh, every little event that unfolds in the household, every little uh, mutiny within the family uh, has ripple effects. And very often the larger things that we see across the world, the larger movements may very well begin, you know, in a tiny event within a household. Uh, and we may be unaware of these events, but, you know, each event collides with the next to, you know, create this grand movement across the world. I do believe that women's stories are vital. Women's stories set within households and domestic are very, very important to recognize, to acknowledge, and to grant them the respect they deserve. Um, and if my novel manages to do that even to a small extent, I think I've been successful. Um, um, as a follow-up on that, I would, uh, can I say, like if one was to say to you, Kate, your novel is actually also has a distinct Indian setting to it. Like uh, Indian uh, marriages are seen as, uh, and traditionally held to be epitome of happiness, harmony, you know, no no disturbance zone. Every Bollywood movie ends with they lived happily ever after. You know, so it is like an attempt to bring out the pain and, pain and the, I would say, the agony evident 
in every marriage and tell it tell it to a larger audience so in that sense can one say it is a indian tone or what would you like to say it's like more general i think there is uh, i mean i would uh, uh, there is a definite indian uh, undertone to it because it is set in bombay uh, for the most part it travels to other places but the core remains bombay so yes the setting is very indian uh, many of the concerns can also be termed as indian but i do feel that the larger uh, canvas the one that uh, you know analyzes the institution of a family i think that is relevant no matter which part of the world you may live in because families no matter uh, the country you inhabit no matter the continent you choose to focus on all families are complicated and all families are paradoxes uh, they uh, claim to be fairly open but they tend to guard some of the darkest deepest secrets uh, families claim to be uh, conventional but they have some of the most rebellious el elements we can think of uh, families are believed to be uh, you know extremely stable but they they could be splintering inside so i think these paradoxes are what um, you know mark every family and i feel that uh, to that extent it doesn't matter where the novel is set the moment you start analyzing families you're dealing with a set of paradoxes okay and uh, if i can say and if i'm allowed with your permission two uncomfortable questions now uh, from a devil's advocate point of view right though i i broadly sort of uh, understand the intent of writing but i also feel i mean um, that there is a pathos the men are also going through especially in the indian scene given then given that they are brought up with that mindset of expecting a woman to behave in a certain manner and then she doesn't turn out to be like that so uh, i would say they are also creators and prisoners of the of the grooming they have been given or of their own histories of families you know so there's a lot of agony and pain that they are going through because they feel that they were not in for that deal at all so and they're not able to understand why women is now talking of choices and other things you know it's not that they don't want to empathize but they just lack that ability to do so so uh, like so don't you think that narrative of men is missing totally because uh, somewhere it's just the women's choices or or her being an agent that is being discussed as if the men had like men were all very benign and like you know so their agony hasn't come out maybe you know so that's a very interesting observation and it's something that i've heard from quite a few people that uh, the men aren't uh, dominant figures in the novel but that again i realize is uh, at one level an uh, attempt on my part to ensure that women get uh, the uh, the kind of attention they deserve there is a tendency otherwise in novels and a lot of novels for men to take over the narrative we know we are aware of the male point of view we are aware of uh, where a lot of them come from the fact is that male privilege is itself everywhere in our day to day lives and uh, you know our workplaces and yes even within the world of a novel um and so i wanted to shift uh, the focus slightly and study a world through the eyes of women with the men being secondary figures because uh, too often we make men uh, the central characters and we reveal the world through uh, their concerns and their voices what would it be like if uh, women gave men agency instead of the other way around you know women decided to speak about the men yeah. rather than you know having a novel in which men and women uh, may not speak as equal partners and men dominate so uh, i did try uh, to play with this a bit and i'm glad if uh, you know uh, people come away with the impression that uh, the women are central to the novel because they are they really are and i wanted the world to be presented through their eyes okay interesting and you know another uh, question as i said uh, another uncomfortable one and i mean that's not to challenge what you written but just to raise the point of view that uh, you you see if i if you look at human life itself and that is on the existential question ki you know what are we looking at are we looking at happiness so if we are to look at the choices we make and so maybe um, your central character diva if she makes a makes a choice and goes away with the man she loves you know and uh, uh, or doesn't make the choice you know and then you find that every relationship is in life about like every relationship where you fall in love and find meaning then becomes mundane after a while why but that is the way life it is you know so even if you find somebody like whom you feel you deal with for a while then after a while the whole mundane uh, things of life of keeping clothes in order or putting dishes in order or cooking 
will take over and then children will take over so so i mean is there a really a running away from that i mean so in that sense i would say um, i mean how do you justify like uh, uh, normal you know it's like so it's like repeating something which is happening over and over in our lives whether we make the choice or we don't make the choice uh, the novel is one that uh, very closely integrates the idea of choice, the extent to which we as women have the freedom to make decisions, the extent to which we inherit the decisions of our, our ancestors, of the other women in our family. Um, and you're right when you say that uh, the pursuit of love can uh, you know, be dazzling at first, but finally it becomes mundane. Uh, the everyday lived reality of being in a relationship can you know, lack laughter. That is true. And... Um, uh, a novel does not uh, necessarily tell us uh, which way uh, a character decides to go, which uh, set of decisions she goes with. And uh, my hope always is that someday tomorrow in the future, maybe when uh, the protagonist, uh, the narrator is uh, several years older, or maybe even at this juncture, uh, she realizes that uh, true love is loving yourself. And uh, there's a Derek Walcott poem called uh, Love After Love where uh, he says that maybe you need to, I'm paraphrasing of course, but he says maybe we need to stick with ourselves and learn to, you know, enjoy our own company and uh, eat bread with the stranger who is yourself. And uh, if uh, my protagonist or if any of the characters in the novel reach that place, I I would be only too happy. I, I have learned uh, the hard way that as a writer, I cannot dictate which way a character goes. I cannot tell a character what to do. The character decides and I simply play long. I follow the voice of the character. Okay, uh, can I say like from a sociological point of view, is the novel questioning the very idea of marriage itself in the times we live in? Like, is it, it is a is novel that is uh, deeply interested with the question of marriage. That's uh, certainly true. Um, and I think uh, these are concerns that nag all the women in the novel, but these are also concerns that uh, that uh, drive the narrative. Uh, the extent to which marriage as an institution actually frees women, uh, the extent to which women can find their voices within uh, what is essentially a fairly patriarchal institution. Uh, how do they emerge? How do they assert themselves? How do they uh, embrace uh, whoever they are and celebrate themselves within uh, you know, the uh, legal definition of a marriage? Uh, so these are concerns that definitely uh, dominate and uh, they concern me, but equally they concern the novel. Okay, so I would say, you know, um, um, I, I had read some books which are also, which belong to the journal where they also talk of the, the choices women make, but in a different context, like if I can say, Manju Kapoor had written about difficult daughters and immigrants and even Amin Shafak in her book, The 40 Rules of Love, somehow like uh, talks of a woman and you know who has to make the choice of being in a mundane setting with a uh, going to a distant land where she may find something of substance so do you think you are trying to make a pitch for that those sort of choices or like or is it like not suggestive at all it is like value neutral what is it like you would you yourself perceive it to be I don't think the novel comes with an agenda where it wishes to tell women what they are supposed to do with their lives. I think uh, the novel, if anything, wants to recognize the importance of you know, the lives of women, their everyday struggles, their attempts at making sense of uh, life. Uh, it does it is very invested in that but i don't think it comes with uh the belief that it has the right to tell women what they're supposed to do with their choices which uh, road they're supposed to take when the road forks um no that's not the intent with which the book was written um i don't think i am in a place where i can uh, make such value judgments and i don't think uh, it would be right for my novel also to venture down that path okay so uh, I would say, you know, though women are these central characters in the novel and it's about marriage, but there is a very um, undercurrent presence of children or offsprings also. Because, you know, the grandmother lives for the mother and the mother finds reason with her daughters, you know. And uh, um, in the introduction, which is yours in the book also, I mean, there's a, there's a bonding, uh, the way your son is described as you're growing up with him. You know, so is there a way of also conveying 
that uh, uh, when men are not there, the, the children or the offspring sort of fill in the gap and play an important role? Like, is there an uh, inclination towards that angle? I don't think the children are there necessarily to fill a gap, and I don't think the children uh, are meant to ever fill a gap um, in uh, uh, in a relationship. Uh, and that's certainly not where the novel is coming from. But yes, I think the moment you start studying family sagas, you start analyzing the institution of a family, inevitably you will be engaging with questions of children, uh, either because the children are there or because the children aren't there or because uh, the children have uh, disappeared somewhere. I mean, uh, children do end up getting woven into this uh, fabric that we call a family. And um, and so uh, it was inevitable, I suppose, that given that my overwhelming concern in this novel was both uh, the family as an institution, marriage as an institution, and uh, women and their role in society, ordinary everyday women who are often you know, dismissed or ignored. Since I wish to study all of that, I think somewhere along the way, the question of uh, you know, the relationship between a mother and daughter, uh, the relationship between sisters, the relationship between a father and child, these are things that will come up inevitably. I think it goes with the terrain. Okay. And uh, now a slightly, uh, if I can ask, I mean, a futuristic question. So uh, now do you think with the coming of this uh, age of biotechnology and artificial intelligence, which has enabled like, you know, women can freeze their eggs and, you know, you need not marry at a certain age to have children. You can have partners. And so do you think it will really change the contours and the choices that women have? And uh, is it like positive or is it like it will break down an institution which should have been preserved longer? I mean, what is your personal take on that? I think it's, uh, uh, it doesn't, it does change some things, but essentially doesn't change uh, some very basic things like uh, the association between uh, the caregiver and the child that has been nurtured, uh, irrespective of how the child emerged, whether the child emerged uh, through a monogamous relationship, whether the child emerged, uh, you know, through uh, medical intervention, whether the child emerged, you know, through, you know, some means that we aren't even aware of today, but that could emerge tomorrow. Uh, at the end of the day, relationship the dynamics that guide the relationship, the feelings that guide the relationship, these uh, are very likely to remain constant. The overwhelming love that the mother feels for her offspring, but a love that is often conflicted because it is at once exhausting and overwhelming. It is at once, uh, you know, it wrenches your heart and yet it empties you out. Um, you know, these are, uh, these are big emotions and these are emotions that I think will remain the same irrespective of how a child may emerge. Yeah, no, I, I mean, my question was like, yes, I mean, those emotions would remain, but the very institution of marriage would be challenged more because now the whole need to marry at a certain age, you know, to marry the person and, you know, to uh, have an offspring at by that age, you know, so that pressure will be off of women. Do you think that will impact in a big way or is it like... Um, I think it's great if uh, we start nudging the idea of marriage, if we uh, either redefine it so that it uh, it offers women the agency they deserve, or we should overhaul it entirely and find a new way of, you know, accommodating uh, the selves that people hold sacred. Uh, I think today uh, in most, uh, in uh, the few families that have the option, a lot of marriages are getting redefined. Uh, partners are negotiating their own, feeling their way around a marriage and renegotiating the terms of engagement. And I think increasingly tomorrow in the future, if that becomes the norm, if we reanalyze how we wish to define a marriage, if we reanalyze if marriage is even relevant today or if there is space for another way of associating with uh, another human being, um, I think that's that's great. I think no institution needs to uh, live forever. It's open to, uh, you know, the forces that exist outside. It's open to being challenged by the times and it's open to modification, redefinition. I think that's entirely healthy and it's wonderful if that happens. And uh, my next one is a slightly tangential question. And uh, if you look at uh, um, the women workforce participation in the economy, I mean, that's highest in, one of the highest is in China. And a trend they found was that the single uh, um, women, 
I mean, women who cho choose not to marry is the highest, one of the highest in the world. You know? So which, uh, when I saw the data also surprised me. So do you think we, I mean, it, it is a, the Indian woman and the marriage question as we have discussed here in, the, in your book would also see a transition given that if the women's workforce participation, will that make a difference? Because the earlier women didn't have a choice. They were the, they were not the bread earners. So they were always dependent on the man and given a choice also they could not leave it. Like, you know, maybe the grandmother or the, but do you think this will now change? I mean, women's working in the, um, I think the economic sector. independence always, I mean, there's no doubt about the fact that economic independence is empowering, that if uh, women find uh, uh, the space to work in conditions that are nurturing, uh, it will it will certainly grant them flight. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about that. But I think it's, a, it's also a fairly complex subject, right? Because today, while we talk about workforce participation, it's wonderful that women are participating in the workforce. There's also the fact that a lot of uh, organizations, a lot of institutions, don't really uh, accommodate uh, the fact that uh, uh, you know uh, maternity and the demands made by maternity are so immense that very often uh, the work-life balance gets completely skewed uh, where uh, mm -hmm. a lot of women find themselves at a disadvantage because they are juggling uh, work they're juggling home uh, and they're juggling more things than one human being should at any given point. So I think while it's wonderful, we do absolutely need to celebrate uh, the fact that women uh, can be economically independent in certain spheres, in certain spaces, in certain bubbles within urban centers. I think uh, we also need to recognize the fact that uh, we need to provide more nurturing working environments, environments that recognize the needs of women, that recognize the needs of new mothers, for instance, the needs of women who are living on their own and battling a very um, hostile environment outside. I think it's really important now for workplaces to step up and not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, proclaim that they have uh, employed women, but also make the environment such that women can tr thrive. Okay, in, in that context only, I mean, um, um, another related question is like, we always say that women, yes, uh, uh, atmosphere need to be there for it to be conducive to women. But uh, uh, very often we don't say that men need to be educated to live with empowered women. Because that's where the whole problem lies, you know. And they, as I said, no, they're also their own sufferers and victims in a certain way because they are not given that agency to think in those terms and they feel that they've been cheated or taken for a ride to have uh, come up with a woman who has a mind of her own. So do you think how we need to address that question of, you know, emancipating or educating men? I mean, how do you go about that? Yeah, I wish I had an easy answer to this. I think it's, like I said, it's a very complex subject. Uh, the moment you talk about uh, overhauling uh, patriarchal systems, capitalistic systems, systems that uh, do not nurture human life, uh, it you're talking about huge and immense change. And um, these changes don't happen easily. Uh, these changes take time. They take uh, immense amounts of education, reading, um, and openness of mind. Um, I, I don't think it's uh, it's easy to you know overhaul uh, structures that exist. Uh, so I wish I had answers. If I had answers, I'm sure you know we'd all be making the world a better place uh, together. But uh, but uh, there aren't easy answers to this. But one can always push for little changes, push for you know a tiny change within the household, and somewhere along the way, you know these little changes build up and we create a better world for our children. Yeah, truly said. We all have to begin at home, I guess. And uh, coming back to your novel personally, like uh, this is your debut novel. So what was really the motivation to bring it out? It was your travels, your mother, your grandmother, I mean, your son. I mean, what was the driving force and how did this plot come together? I mean, I mean, going into the writer's I mind, I can share the some of years from your... I think my driving force has always been my love for words and language and the fact that um, I'm deeply invested in finding, uh, you know, the perfect set of words to describe uh, a situation, an emotion, uh, a fleeting instant in time. Um, 
and I think uh, the pursuit of words is what has kept me going for the last uh, uh, almost eight years that it took me to write the novel. Uh, but I think along with that, I think it's the fact that I was obsessed with uh, the characters in my novel. And I don't think they would have let me be if I abandoned them midway. They uh, were living, breathing entities. And I had to honor them by, you know, completing this novel uh, to the best of my ability. And uh, so I think it's the combination of uh, my love for language and the fact that uh, the characters uh, absolutely obsessed me. So, uh, uh... Would you say like this is like a, uh, something in the uh, League of Little Women, you know, which we can refer to when we, uh, um, with age, we can teach our daughters to be like, would you like to be called the Louisa May Alcott for India? Um, <laughs> I, I would not uh, dare compare myself to, you know, the giants in the field. Um, I, I just want, I hope that my voice is distinctive. I can hope for that. And I can hope for the fact that the story finds a place amongst the million other stories that exist in the world. I hope it finds its little corner. That's, that's all I can hope for. Okay. And uh, uh, so, so more on, uh, I mean, we've discussed marriage and uh, the choices uh, women have to have had to make. Um, and if I can just ask you, like, do you think in history we've had women like Draupadi, you know, um, uh, making a choice when it came to marriage? And uh, our own history has been repeated many such examples. I mean, Gargi defeated the giant Chakra, Chandra Shara in debate, you know. So do you think, uh, I mean, we, we have not drawn enough from the uh, uh, huge repository of culture that we've had or and, uh, that has not been presented in the correct light or I mean, I mean what is your personal take as an author on that? On uh, the way our culture has depicted uh, women in mythology? Yes. Um, well, I think what's fascinating about Indian mythology, and this is true for all uh, mythologies in general, is that it's open to interpretation right and that uh, while we can uh, read the myth as one that uh, you know denies women any uh, voice any power any agency we can also reread the myth so that um, you know women emerge as creatures who are assertive have a space in the world of their own uh, so i think that's what i find so incredible about mythology it's why i also dip into mythology when i am writing my novel i weave in myths um, into the story because i feel that myths are not static myths are open to interpretation reinterpretation they are open to you know the forces that exist outside they uh, converse with the times we live in and modify they morph they change they grow and so uh, and I, 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 you know, while it's very easy for us to say that, uh, you know, certain figures in Indian mythology, certain women in Indian mythology uh, appear weak or appear defenseless or appear to be subjugated. It's also true that if we reread the story in a different way, if we uh, nudge the story a little bit, these very women can emerge as extremely powerful figures. So I think a lot depends on how you choose to read mythology and how you choose to uh, phrase it, word it, uh, give it uh, a flight. Okay. In fact, I would say that even in your novels, I mean, we, we can read it this way too. I mean, the women, despite not being given an uh, agency, have really stood out and uh, lived life on their own terms, you know. So, yeah. despite being denied an agency, I, mean, the, I don't want to reveal, as I said, if I do... So in a way, the grandmother, the mother, you know, they, they chose to take the bull by the horns and then take life on their own terms. So um, I think your your interpretation of history finds a resonance in that. And uh, to that extent, I, I think we all women need to compliment you because you've really been a, a sort of you're pioneering that sort of writing where women making the difficult choices will now no longer be seen as taboo or villain by the society or you know, otherwise, you know, you always are like that. Uh, how the whole question of fidelity in marriage has been dealt with, you know, and uh, uh, it's, it's not difficult to break bonds. So, I mean, what do would you say on that? About the question of fidelity and the extent to which, uh, you know, we have the space to break bonds? Yes. Uh, well, um, fidelity is always a, I, I don't think, uh, to begin with, I should 
uh, preface this by saying that um, I'm not really um, engaging with questions of fidelity because uh, my concerns are deeper. My concerns in, are the extent to which women have the right, the space, the agency to pursue a life of meaning whatever that life may be for them, however they may define it at that moment. And the definition could change as they grow older, as circumstances shift. But at that moment, whatever their definition is of a fulfilling life, do they have the right to pursue it? Now, uh, sometimes in certain situations for some of the characters, uh, the, uh, the question does emerge, uh, the question that emerges is whether they have uh, the right to break free of marriage, whether they can pursue other loves. Um, and uh, I don't think my novel wishes to pass value judgment here uh, because I don't think it's for me to judge such decisions. And I don't think it's a uh, novel's job either to, uh, you know, say that certain decisions are right or wrong. I think we take decisions in the heat of the moment. We take decisions that feel right at a given point of time for us and sometimes for those around us. And, uh, and in hindsight, we might uh, feel differently about things, but at that moment, we take the best decision possible. And I think for some of the characters, again, um, breaking free of a marriage or not breaking free of a marriage may be the best decision for them at that given point in time. Um, and we may wish for them to live another life. We may wish for them to, uh, you know, negotiate these crossroads differently. But the fact is that given their histories, given what they confronted, given the set of choices they had, and given uh, all that they carried with them in terms of memories, in terms of, you know, legacies, uh, this is the best that they could do. Wonderful. And uh, and lastly, I would just like to compliment you for uh, giving us such a wonderful piece of art, I would say. You, you, it shows your labor of love and uh, reading it was an absolute joy and a pleasure. And I think every reader uh, and every woman reader and equally men readers find joy in it and find substance and meaning in it and try to understand what it is to be a woman of of who are trying to find meaning in their lives and that there is an agony inherent in uh, the tasks that are sort of imposed on them without their agency. You know? So, uh, so our compliments, Zalini, and one last statement or any last thing that you would like to say before we conclude? Um, For the audience. I, that I hope we, we all come to a place where we learn to celebrate the women in our lives that uh, irrespective of uh, what uh, they may have achieved on paper. Um, and we are a society that's resume obsessed, but irrespective of what the resume may read, I feel that if we learn to celebrate every woman in our life, no matter how ordinary her story may appear, um, I think uh, we have achieved something phenomenal. Wonderful. So I think uh, today we conclude on that note. And it was, it was a pleasure to have you to listen directly from the budding authoress uh, Dharani Baskar and wish you many more accolades. I'm told you're also shortlisted for the JCB Prize.